Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining the webcast. This is Tim Hall, Vice President of Product Management for HortonWorks. Um, today uh, joining me is Joe Witt, uh, Director of Engineering for us here at HortonWorks. Uh, and we're going to talk today about the HortonWorks uh, Dataflow product, um, a new offering um, that we are uh, launching. And uh, appreciate everybody's uh, attention uh, during the webcast. And if you have questions, uh, we have live uh, audience messaging that you can uh, lob your questions in, and we'll have uh, time at the end for some Q&A, assuming Joe and I don't talk too much. Um, so with that, um, we want to talk a bit about um, Hortonworks Dataflow. Uh, this is our new product, which is fundamentally powered by uh, Apache NiFi. And we're going to talk a bit more about what NiFi is, where it came from, its heritage, and what problems it attempts to solve. But to set things up, uh, obviously we're going to talk a little bit about roadmaps, so I need to show you our disclaimer slide. Um, everything we do is uh, done within the open source community, and as we work on features and additions and capabilities to the product, uh, obviously those things are gated by the community process that's run through the ASF. So uh, in case we need to work harder on um, uh, landing all those things, sometimes those may, may take a little longer than others uh, to get everybody's agreement. But um, general idea is, um, to, that uh, we're going to run through the standard uh, meritocracy that's uh, run by the ASF. So agenda today for the webcast, um, we're going to talk about the new, new data sources uh, and the rise of the Internet of Anything. And, and what we mean by the Internet of Anything is any data, anytime, anywhere, collecting that for both um, uh, historical insights, but also looking to take advantage of that data and how that data is flowing uh, from its source uh, all the way back to the data center. We're going to talk about uh, the Dataflow product itself and what its capabilities are, uh, key concepts, uh, its architecture, and uh, supporting use cases. And then we're going to talk about um, how Hortonworks Dataflow is complementary to HDP, uh, our Hadoop uh, offering, uh, and particularly looking at some qualities of enterprise readiness and streaming analytics. Uh, and then we'll go through some planned enhancements that are uh, already underway within the Apache NiFi community and then uh, leave some time for questions and answers. So with that, uh, I want to focus a bit on what's going on in the world of data. Um, so at the bottom, you see the traditional data sources from being generated from a variety of application systems like ERP, CRM, uh, supply chain management systems, human capital management systems, and others. Those are all being stored in trad traditional databases. But where we see a vast uh, array of information coming from these days is what we're calling the Internet of Anything. Sensors and machine data, geolocation, server logs, click streams, social media, files and emails, and many, many more. Uh, you can imagine every application on your phone, uh, notions of co connected car, uh, any metal that moves today has uh, sensor data. And the opportunity is to take that information uh, from its source, bring it in, analyze it, and um, we're seeing uh, just uh, uh, explosive growth in this area. And the, and the, the challenge is, um, at least from the traditional way that um, Hortonworks viewed this as a Hadoop vendor, is how do we ingest that data? How do we flow that data from its source? How do we securely uh, manage it, monitor it? Um, how do we address the change scenarios that are occurring with it? How do we enrich it? Um, and that's been a big problem. And so we set out to, to look for a way to address uh, ease of ingestion, doing that securely, and uh, ensuring that we knew uh, about the chain of custody, the pr data provenance. Where did that data come from um, so that we could trace it back? Now, in terms of um, uh, our friends at Gartner, when they start talking about what's going on in terms of the interconnectedness uh, and the demands of user centricity, um, there's been discussion about the Internet of Data. And this is traditionally where the Hortonworks data platform has played. It has played. Uh, powered by Hadoop at its core, the analysis and um, cost-effective storage of that data uh, is, is what we've been focused on. Where we're shifting our focus now uh, and adding uh, a new product line is for uh, the Internet of Things and focused on data flow, securely collecting, conducting, and curating the data in motion, but also driving uh, value for the data at rest, analytics, and use cases that we traditionally supported through HDP. So the Internet of Anything is really driving a bunch of new requirements from customers wanting to get trusted insights uh, from that data at the very edge 
uh, sometimes what we call the jagged edge, where these devices um, and sensors live, all the way back to their data lakes uh, within the data center. And they want full fidelity of that information uh, over time. Of course, sometimes that's gated by things like limited bandwidth, uh, um, uh, occasional connectivity to the internet and others. And so addressing those requirements is one of the things that we set out uh, to find and then solve. We're also looking at modern, modern applications which need access to both the data at rest from a historical perspective, but also may want to take action uh, or what we call um, address perishable insights for that data while it's in motion. Uh, in the world of IoT, um, data flows are no longer unidirectional, meaning it's not, su it's not um, sufficient to just take that data and land it into uh, storage and persist it. We may want to interact with it dynamically. We may want to change the way in which um, certain information is prioritized over time. So there becomes a more bidirectional means uh, in which you're interacting with the data and how it's flowing from those sources all the way back to your data center. And then last but not least, uh, the perimeter these days is uh, uh, aggressively moving uh, outside the data center to the, to the jagged edge. And that jagged edge is uh, things like the connected car, uh, mobile applications, uh, things that, that traditionally have not you know, sat within the data center. And so the idea is how do we also address those kinds of environments uh, in the context of all of these uh, different use cases. So of course there are limitations today, and this is one of the things that we were looking at as a sort of Hadoop vendor. Um, the traditional data movement uh, has really been built for that, that one-way flow um, traditionally, and we know that we needed to address a more uh, dynamic way in, uh, in which to deal with the data as it's flowing. Um, the tools that have been built around this um, have been difficult to manage and sometimes architect architecturally disjointed, meaning um, we'll build individual tools to solve individual data flow problems and bringing them together in a holistic environment with a palette of options that allows you to, to put these things together is, uh, is what we wanted to address. Um, for business, uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges for uh, long-term uh, historical insight and analysis is simply landing the data itself. So anything we can do to ease that ingestion, uh, regardless of where that information is coming from, is a huge win. Um, and of course, we, we mentioned the jagged edge, you know, data flowing from, you know, sensors that may be on uh, ships or airplanes or um, oil rigs, uh, retail chain stores that may uh, not have, you know, high fidelity bandwidth. Um, we'd like to be able to optimize and um, uh, optimize the flow of that data uh, and use the, the least costly means to get that information back to a central source. And of course, the biggest deal is um, there are insights that are, are going on that you would like to take action on immediately. Um, it's not good enough to, to simply have a historical view of the world. Um, how do we address things like a truck in motion um, whose uh, cooling uh, unit goes out and the food is spoiled on the way to, uh, to a grocery chain? We'd like to be able to detect that before that truck arrives and ensure that that food doesn't go on the shelves. Um, and so looking to address those things as rapidly as possible uh, is, is part of the, the challenges we're set out to solve. So in order to do that, um, Hortonworks went out and acquired a company. Um, very similar to the way that Hortonworks was formed, where uh, Yahoo was uh, the original company behind Hadoop and uh, decided to open source the Hadoop uh, platform into uh, Apache. Um, and then Hortonworks was founded as a commercial entity uh, to provide support for Hadoop and the Hadoop ecosystem of components. Um, we found that uh, the team from Inyara had a similar journey and a similar uh, makeup to us, which is um, originally Apache NiFi, which is the technology many of their uh, employees were working on, uh, was created uh, at the NSA um, and then delivered uh, to Apache through the technology transfer program in the fall of 2014. And then Yara was founded, just like Hortonworks was, to provide uh, commercial support uh, around Apache NiFi itself. And so in order to address some of those architectural limitations and those use case challenges that we mentioned before, we found that NiFi was an extremely uh, powerful uh, technology that, that was very complementary to what we were already doing here at Hortonworks. And we found the DNA of the, the um, uh, individuals and the management team at Anyara extremely uh, complementary to um, you know, our history and heritage here at Hortonworks. And so we thought this marriage made a, a ton of sense um, and we welcomed the Anyara team here a few weeks ago uh, joining us 
uh, and now we're, we're proud to uh, launch the Hortonworks Dataflow offering, again, powered by Apache NiFi, uh, to help us uh, with data ingest and some of these other challenges. So the way that this will work uh, for those customers that may already be familiar with HDP, uh, which is powered by Apache Hadoop, uh, we'll have a new product offering here, Dataflow, powered by Apache NiFi. And the idea is to help us deal with the, you know, all of these different sources of, of new and emerging data sets, uh, help us extract those perishable insights, and then integrate with HDP in terms of its ability to store the data and associated metadata, um, also providing the ability to enrich uh, uh, the data flow uh, product itself with that historical information that we have access to. Um, these will be independent offerings from a support subscription perspective, but of course we will deeply integrate and ensure that they work together very effectively. And we'll talk a little bit more later about uh, some of our ideas about where we're going to take this uh, going forward. So in terms of um, the Internet of Anything and data flow, you can think of um, uh, HDF as uh, Hortonworks data flow as focusing on the acquisition of data and flowing that data uh, to uh, persistent store. And of course, um, HDP is focused on both the process and analysis of that data on top of that storage. So we get a nice uh, story here to both acquire the data, flow it to the right location, and analyze it together. And of course, when you look at uh, the realities of, of that simplistic view, Organizations today uh, are global, right? We're spanning uh, different geos. Uh, there may be multi-data center deployments for everything from disaster recovery to uh, deal with, um, you know, other uh, restrictions in terms of the uh, regulatory environments and, and, per and you know, dealing with personal data. Um, again, we've got uh, global organizations that have, you know, far-flung uh, entities. Again, retail chains uh, out in remote locations or uh, in oil and gas. Uh, you've got oil rigs and, and, and um, trucks moving between locations. Um, you've got business partners that you want to share data with uh, for interesting and compelling use cases. And of course, all of these things have a different velocity and variety of, of information that needs to be exchanged. And of course, bandwidth and latency of that information and how it can move around uh, is one of the, the critical challenges. And so, um, what we set out to, to find was technology that could deal with small footprints, uh, potentially operating with very little power, um, being able to optimize the flow of, of both the control plane data as well as metadata over potentially limited bandwidth uh, environments, uh, ensuring that the, the data would be available uh, for those um, perishable insights and do it in a secure and, and repeatable fashion. And so that's really the, the um, when we set out to, to try to figure out what was the right uh, technology and team uh, to work on this with us. That's how we ran into uh, the folks from Anyara and, uh, of course, Apache NiFi. But, of course, it's not only at the edge. Um, we've got plenty of data flow requirements within the data center itself. And, again, this has been one of the challenges of, of um, you know, many of the customers that we've been working with in terms of Hadoop is to simplify the, uh, the data ingestion problem. So how do we understand the data um, and where it's come from, from the various systems that may reside within the data center itself. How do we provide them with agility to deal with changes in those new uh, data types as they're coming in uh, uh, and changing over time, which is, again, you can sort of set up the original job, but as things, uh, you know, move forward down the track, um, things change. And uh, the ability for you to quickly deal with those changes and continue to flow that data for your analysis needs uh, is absolutely critical. We need the ability to handle dynamic access controls and security. Um, again, these things change frequently as well. Um, you have different cross-cutting concerns in terms of uh, being able to enrich, filter, and transform uh, data. Um, and of course, um, looking at this transition that uh, many organizations are under from those legacy systems to uh, modern 24 by seven, always on uh, various events that are occurring and the variety of the format schema and protocols that are, uh, that are now in use today. None of that is slowing down. And so we believe that um, uh, Apache NiFi uh, was a great uh, and complementary technology to bring into uh, Hortonworks, um, and we're excited to bring it to you all today. So we're going to start by drilling down with Joe on uh, NiFi itself, the, the core of the Hortonworks Dataflow uh, product, and we'll start with uh, the three key concepts. Joe? Thanks, Tim. I appreciate it. Uh, and thank you all for uh, uh, being here today to listen to us uh, talk to you about Hortonworks Dataflow. Um, 
I would just want to start with kind of a simple introduction to Apache NiFi itself, um, which really kind of frames a lot of the philosophy that we're going after with Hortonworks Dataflow. Um, in everything that I'll describe for NiFi, there's, there's kind of three main uh, kind of central themes that we want to keep in mind as we go through this. Uh, one of them is just fundamentally being able to provide a really solid uh, management experience for how to control how systems connect to each other, what happens to data as it moves through systems, um, just fundamentally providing really solid data flow management. The next piece then um, that's related to that but uh, is its own concept is this idea of data provenance, which is uh, we want to record really fine-grained detail about everything that happens to data, where it comes from, what do we learn about it, what do we do to it, um, you know, where do we, where do we send it to, uh, when is the, the life of an object completed, right, sort of managing that life cycle throughout the data flow. Um, and that drives some really important user experience uh, to make the management problem easier, but it also feeds into some really important uh, bigger picture enterprise concerns like uh, uh, enterprise-wide governance and so on. Uh, finally, a, a really important uh, part of this uh, or, or piece of this domain then is providing rock-solid security uh, on both the control plane and the data plane. Uh, and we say this because we've been talking about this bidirectional data flow um, and part of this bi-directional story is being able to handle the data efficiently and securely, uh, but also the commands to change behavior. Um, and that requires us to have a robust security approach uh, for both spaces. And we'll talk about these a little bit more as we go along. Okay, so uh, just going to describe at a, a high level some of the key features just to kind of put it in the right mindset of, of what... Uh, uh, Hortonworks Dataflow powered by Apache NiFi will provide uh, out of the box, um, and then we'll talk through a little bit of the architecture and and do uh, you know look through the actual app through slides. So uh, the first thing to talk about is guaranteed delivery. Uh, as you increase the volume of data, um, and as you deal with the fact that there are uh, power failures and system failures and uh, network issues and so on, uh, it's really important that you have a robust uh, guaranteed delivery story. Uh, that means providing transactional communication to wherever data is coming from, as well as within the data flow system itself, as, uh, in addition to where it's delivered. Um, and it's really important to keep in mind here, we're not talking about a transaction between the producer and the consumer. Uh, we're talking about a transaction between NiFi and the system that it's getting data from, uh, as well as NiFi and the systems it's delivering data to. Uh, most data flows really aren't linear, right? They form these big graphs. Uh, where data comes in but then is delivered to multiple systems in parallel. Um, and so you have to have robust kind of transactional guaranteed delivery stories, and NIFI certainly does that. Um, I'll describe that a little bit as we look at the architecture here in just a minute. The next thing then is data buffering. Uh, and fundamentally, the thing to keep in mind whenever you're in the data flow business, when you're, whenever you're in the uh, business of connecting systems, uh, no matter what, there's always some system that is down or degraded. Uh, and that's just a reality. And so you have to inherently support buffering um, to be able to tolerate those systems that may not be online at any given moment in time, uh, may not be able to keep up with the rate of, of data flow. Um, and so what this also means then is you have to have some important kind of first-class features. One of those then is back pressure. Um, it's not enough to just simply uh, buffer indefinitely and then the data flow system itself becomes at risk. So you have to have some way of effectively throttling um, all the way back to the point where you may, in fact, uh, slow down the consumption of data. Um, now, you may say, in, in the case of my organization, I can't do that, right? The, the producer is always sending data. I have to always be listening. And that's fine as well, right? You have to make a choice between whether you have back pressure or some sort of pressure release mechanism. Uh, and so NIFI supports both models um, because these are just kind of realities that exist in data flow. The next thing, then, is if you have this data buffering, uh, very often what you want to be able to do is prioritize data. Um, it, it's commonly talked about today as kind of like natural ordering or insertion order, uh, and that makes sense for a subset of use cases. But in the broad sort of enterprise sense, uh, as you're dealing with constrained bandwidth or constrained resources, you have to make prioritization decisions. And so the, the queuing mechanism that NIFI supports allows you to prioritize data dynamically. Um, and uh, as Tim mentioned, thinking about the, the jagged edge in particular, uh, you can imagine that 
when your access to data exceeds the bandwidth you have to send it back, you fundamentally have a prioritization decision to make. Uh, and that's really what, what drove this um, kind of design long ago. The next thing to talk about then is flow-specific quality of service. And what we mean here is it's not enough to just tune the whole system to be, uh, you know, low latency oriented or tune the whole system to be high throughput oriented. I mean, these are somewhat at odds ideas um, and, and there's trade-offs being made. And we want to enable people to make those trade-offs at very specific points in the flow and specific to what that particular data flow needs or that particular consumer might need. Uh, and so um, we allow you to control that at a really fine grain level. Um, but at the same time, we also allow you to control loss tolerance. You may have situations where you have a developmental flow or a flow that if it's not delivered within some time, right? Uh, Tim talked about perishable insights, for example. Uh, if you have data which needs to be consumed, let's say, within seconds to be of value, well, once it's minutes old, then you can terminate it. Uh, and so we enable you to choose the points in the flow that if you do want to let data age off, then it will do that for you. Um, you can think of that as being a form of that pressure release we described a moment ago. Um, we already talked a little bit about data provenance on the previous uh, slide, and I'll show you what that looks like in the application just to make that more concrete. It's a bit of an um, unfamiliar term for a lot of folks. Uh, it's not a new concept, but uh, um, it is a very important idea to discuss, so I'll, I'll describe that further as we go ahead. The other thing to keep in mind is we're building this, this rolling log of really detailed history of what happened both to the content of data as well as the context of what we've learned about it. And we want to keep that as long as we possibly can. It's not just once data enters the flow, I keep track of it until it's out and then I get rid of it. I want to keep that as long as I can. Uh, you know, real time is important. Being able to interact with the flow is important. Uh, but it's equally important to be able to go back in time and sort of step through and understand what happened. Um, and the architecture that we have, uh, the provenance data that we have, allows you to do that in a really powerful way. The other thing then is visual command and control. Think of this as part of that management story I was describing. Uh, what we want to enable people to do is to have uh, real time or interactive command and control with the data flow. Uh, this is really important because uh, largely what people see today are design and deploy type systems where you may be able to build the flow uh, that you need visually, but you're building it kind of all at once and then you deploy it out. Um, the problem with a model like that is the feedback cycle is too slow and the cause and effect is um, kind of blurred. Uh, you can think of NiFi as uh, providing this really immediate feedback to every change that you made. Uh, and that's important because it helps you understand whether what you did had a good outcome or a bad outcome. Uh, and if it's not what you were looking for, then you can immediately correct it uh, and kind of keep iterating. Now, the key thing to think in, or to keep in mind there is when we say, uh, you know, visual command and control, people immediately assume kind of the human use case, right? The human actor making changes to the system. Um, but again, if we think back to this bi-directional data flow story we're talking about here, the interactive command and control doesn't just enable people to make changes, it enables systems to make changes. Autonomous feedback is kind of the idea to think about. What we want to be able to do is have analytic results immediately feed back to changing the behavior of how the data flow works. That could be changing prioritization decisions. It could be uh, electing for recovery cases to kick off. It could mean adding new data flows or removing existing ones. Whatever the case may be, everything that a person can do through the data flow, we want systems to be able to do as well. That has a lot of implications on how to design the system. The other thing then uh, are these flow templates, which is to say that you can build data flows, establish and test them and decide that they're, you know, sort of gold standard, good to go, and now you can save that as a pre-configured component, if you will, an already connected set of processors and relationships uh, that allow data to flow a certain sort of predetermined way. And now you can share that with other organizations, other teams, uh, you know, configuration, manage that, whatever the case may be. It enables sharing and reuse, but on a, on a higher level. Um, the next thing is that we have a pluggable authorization model today that allows you to take uh, and use you know, something as simple as a local file as an authority mechanism, but also to call out to an external service. Uh, think of something like Active Directory or um, some third-party uh, authorization service that you may already have. Every organization has some form of one, and so we just know from the outset that this is something that has to be pluggable. Um, and uh, similarly, we already support uh, multi-role security, uh, things like uh, users who can 
only read the flow or see it, but not manipulate it. Uh, and we'll go into this a bit more here uh, as we dive into the security story uh, in a few slides from now. Um, another key point to bring up is that it's designed for extension. Anyone who's dealt with the data flow problem, if you've ever made a script, if you've ever run kind of traditional integration tools, uh, or if you've ever had to connect systems using, you know, whatever mechanism the case may be, you know that it's never done. This is an inherently last mile challenge. There's always some new protocol, always some new format, uh, some new schema, something that requires you to go beyond, you know, all the tools that are already sitting in the toolbox. And we, we understand that from the outset. NIFI is designed to be easily extended uh, in a way that allows you to build components that still show up uh, looking consistent and cohesive in the UI. Uh, and that allow you to have a lot of built-in uh, fault tolerance, uh, error handling, sort of consistent behavior. Uh, the final point to make, uh, while Tim talked about it earlier, is, um, you know, we want to be able to support those really small environments, uh, but sometimes you are running in a large data center. And so, uh, you know, we have a scale-out story through this clustering mechanism. Um, we're not talking about hundreds or thousands of nodes here. We're talking about a set of nodes all working uh, cooperatively to feed data into the processing systems, be it Storm, Spark, or others, um, where those would have, you know, potentially a much larger footprint. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this is just sort of a listing of some of the use cases that NIFI has been um, exposed to uh, over the years. Um, one that's really uh, kind of easy or interesting to talk about is this uh, predictive analytics scenario. Uh, and when you think about the heart of what's happening in a predictive analytic case, what you're trying to do as an organization is to acquire as much information as possible to give you the most accurate picture that you can get to determine whether a failure or some negative situation will occur. Not that it already has occurred, but that it's likely to occur. Uh, this is really important uh, in industries or situations where uh, you want to be able to keep uh, systems or processes uh, in operation, um, and if you're able to provide, you know, upfront maintenance or things that help avoid kind of uh, a longer-term uh, outage, then you can save a lot of money, right? It, it helps greatly with the bottom line. At the heart of that, then, is a very important data flow challenge, both out at the jagged edge uh, as well as within the data center. Uh, from a jagged edge perspective, let's say you're capturing information off of things like um, you know, cars or trains or planes, whatever the case may be. Uh, and in every single one of those cases, you're capturing information and delivering it over highly constrained comms. You're also running in environments where you don't have access to a multitude of servers, or even if you do have, you know, um, you know compute resources, they're going to be very limited. They're going to be small CPUs. Uh, they're going to be limited memory, limited storage. And so the challenge there is acquiring that data um, as reliably as possible prioritizing it and delivering it back to the data center. Once data arrives at the data center, you now have data coming in from a variety of sources, uh, ideally multiple sources, potentially even about the same concept, right, so that you can get a bigger picture, right, provide more context to provide uh, or to have kind of a richer predictive um, analytic kind of success probability, right? Um, and in that case, you have the uh, agility challenge that we talked about previously, which is how do I manage the flow of this information right now? How do I understand what's happening and then be able to affect change? Uh, and so um, that plays to a, a really core strength of NIFI like we've described with this interactive command and control. But let's take this a step further. In the predictive analytic case where you're trying to detect failures, uh, detect impending failure, what if you miss it, right? What happens if you did not detect the failure? Uh, and chances are the reason you didn't detect it is because the data that you were looking for didn't arrive or you were looking for the wrong information in the first place. Well, one of the really important features that NIFI provides is this provenance concept that we've talked about. What that allows somebody to do is go back retroactively and select to have uh, data that may have previously been considered lower priority and not made at home, to have that be recovered and re-delivered. That drives some really important um, kind of like diagnostic analysis use cases so that you can improve uh, your predictive analytics and data flow chain. Um, so there's a really kind of strong story there based on the interactive command and control uh, as well as that provenance and recovery and replay case. Um, and then, of course, we haven't even touched on it yet, but there's also the security aspects. How do you trust and understand the origin and attribution of that data 
having a fine-grained chain of custody or, or data provenance solution uh, is how you do that. Um, and these are just foundational features uh, built into Apache NiFi. Um, okay. So we'll take a, a brief moment to talk architecture. Um, and really, a couple of key points that we want to get across here. On the left, think of this as uh, a simple node. It could be something as small as, you know, a, a one core device, uh, maybe one or two CPUs, uh, very limited RAM, maybe 512 megabytes to maybe a couple gigabytes. Um, could be something like a flash drive, a really small flash drive, uh, or uh, SSDs or spinning disks, some sort of really small uh, device or just limited footprint uh, enterprise server, right? Uh, and in this case, we're running in a JVM. Uh, within that JVM, we have a web server, and that web server is how all the commands come into NiFi. It goes through a RESTful API. That's what dictates what happens to the flow. It's also how you can observe what's, um, you know, this is how you can look at status. Um, uh, behind that, then, is an engine. Uh, think of it as a sort of processing engine, which is running all of these extensions to acquire data, to assess some relative value, make prioritization decisions, uh, and then ultimately deliver on to follow sy uh, follow on systems um, behind the scenes though so that we can provide guaranteed uh, delivery so that we can uh, do really um, sort of high throughput and low latency processing uh, as well as keep track of this kind of chain of custody for data we have three repositories one keeps track of the metadata uh, sort of about the objects going through the flow the other keeps track of the actual raw bits themselves, right, the messages or records or tuples or whatever you have coming off of uh, source systems. Uh, and then finally, we have a provenance repository, which is where we keep track of all the uh, lineage um, information. Each of these are separate because they have different kind of lifespans, um, different kind of design principles behind them. They're sort of solving different parts of the problem. Um, but if you think back to that recovery of diagnostic scenario I just described in the predictive analytics case, it's that provenance repository that would be queried to look for uh, data that was not delivered. And then it can be recovered because it links to the content repository. And we keep the content as long as we can. We don't age it off until we have to, based on size requirements or based on uh, age requirements. Um, so if you take that same simple story, that same exact user experience, but now we want to scale that out. Um, and so now we have this clustering mechanism that allows us to have a uh, controller uh, which is replicating requests to all the nodes who operate the same way. They all have the same behavior, same configuration. Uh, they're just receiving different slices of data. Um, this is how we can scale out and yet provide the exact same user experience. Um, it's important to talk through or, or think about how we ensure kind of high availability or durability of the data flows. Even if a node drops out of the cluster, the cluster continues on uh, by using protocols like, for example, NiFi provides a site-to-site -site protocol that handles uh, load balancing and failover uh, automatically, uh, shares information about what's going on in the flow, uh, allows the client to either push or pull, both on giving data to NiFi as well as getting data from NiFi. Uh, and so your data flow continues running despite a node dropping or if you need to add a new node, that's fine. You don't have to pre-coordinate that. Uh, we want to enable operations teams to be as flexible and agile as possible. Uh, if that cluster manager goes down for any reason, the nodes in the flow continue operating. Uh, you can't bring up the UI at that point, but as soon as you bring the uh, NCM back online, uh, again, you can see the flow. Uh, and so we've taken a lot of steps to make sure that despite a range of potential failure cases, um, that the the sort of business case, this, this data flow requirements that they keep running. Okay, so uh, just going to walk through uh, a few screenshots um, of what it's like to um, operate in Hortonworks Dataflow powered by Apache NiFi. Um, just to give you a visual sense of what's happening, this is something which frankly is a lot more fun to uh, just download on your desktop uh, and try for yourself. Uh, what you're looking at here is a screenshot of NiFi uh, running in a web browser. Uh, any HTML5 uh, from the web browser should work well. Um, the um, screen that we're looking here, you can think of that as a blank canvas. Uh, and that's essentially what happens when you start NiFi for the first time is you have this engine sitting there ready to do something, and now you can start to design the flow that you want. And so that's what we have shown here on this next slide. 
you uh, select from the top left, you click and drag down into the graph where you want to add a component. And uh, now you start the process of selecting which component you want to add. And so, for example, uh, today there's about 90 processors in Apache NiFi um, that come out of the box. And uh, what you can do is search based on their name or based on tags. And these are to do things like interact with databases to get and push data, perhaps, or to interact with um, HTTP or JMS or um, other open source projects like Kafka and Solar and so on. Um, and once you've acquired data, uh, you can do things like enrich it and make routing decisions and transform the content. Uh, things like converting CSV to Avro or uh, converting Avro to JSON. There's a whole range of kind of scenarios that you can walk through. Um, there's also support for um, interacting with kind of uh, legacy systems, like if you just have to pull files off of a file system or if you want to store files somewhere. Or say you want to set up an alerting flow, you can send emails. However, there's a whole range of these kind of uh, Legos, if you will, that you can throw onto the chart, uh, onto the flow and, and build. So we pick one of these uh, processors for our flow. In this case, we want to grab the processor that interacts with Twitter. And so we've typed in Twitter. We see that we have this get Twitter processor, and so we click add. Um, and now we can start configuring that processor. So it's on the graph, and now I want to give it some properties. When we do that, we're able to specify what uh, type of Twitter endpoint we want to be, for example, um, any terms that we may want to filter on, uh, a whole range of things that are specific to what that processor does. Uh, and so you adjust those parameters. Uh, and now you, um, you have this processor on the graph. It's ready to go. It can actually acquire data and start um, doing some processing on it. Um, but the next thing that you want to do is deliver that data somewhere. And so in this case, we're going to put these tweets into HDFS. So we're going to drag and drop that processor icon again onto the graph and type in uh, put or HDFS or uh, any number of tags that will quickly get us there. And once we've done that, we can grab this put HDFS process uh, and we can configure it. We can tell it where to find the configuration file for interacting with HDFS, uh, directories that we may want to write to, uh, how we want to handle certain conflicts, uh, and a range of other kind of uh, HDFS specific tuning parameters. Once we've done that now, we have two processors on the graph, and now it's a matter of dragging a relationship from get Twitter to put HDFS. Just click and drag. Uh, when we do that, we now get to decide behavior of what happens on that connection. This is where we get to set things like prioritization. Um, let me go back. This is where we can set things like uh, how we prioritize the data, uh, whether we want back pressure to kick in. So let's say we're having trouble delivering to HDFS fast enough uh, and we want to stop pulling in the tweets, for example. Uh, back pressure would automatically do that. If it hits some triggered threshold, uh, then the previous processor would start slowing down. That causes a really nice kind of natural propagation all the way back to the source. So now we have uh, this stuff wired up. We have our get processor or get Twitter processor, put HDFS. They're now connected. Uh, and we can go up to the top of the graph and just hit play. Um, or you could play individual components, whatever the case may be. You can do that. You can build it while the data is flowing uh, as much as you like. Um, and immediately the data starts flowing. The UI is giving you a uh, rolling uh, five minute window of information about what's happening. You know, basically the past five minute window of what's happening. Statistics about how many bytes have been read, how many bytes have been written, uh, how many objects in total are being dealt with. Um, and this gives you really important information as an operator wanting to understand what's happening to my system at runtime, what's happening to my system in production, which parts of the flow are using the most resources. Uh, we're actually counting the bytes that are being read by the processor and written by the processor to the underlying uh, repositories. That information is really valuable so that you can see where, you know, what parts of the flow are consuming system resources. We're also tracking things like how many tasks are run, how many times do we give that processor a thread to execute, and when we do, how much uh, wall clock time is being consumed to do that function. Really important information that if you're an operator allows you to understand what's happening to your system uh, in production, or if you're a developer, it allows you to see and, and really fine-tune uh, fine um, latency behavior as you, you know, pick different uh, configuration settings. 
Um, so uh, as I've mentioned a little bit here, you can already start to, or you can immediately start to dynamically adjust these properties. So you don't have to stop the entire flow or deploy an entirely new one. You can go to very fine-grained points of the flow and tweak configuration settings. You can even add new processors onto the graph and just click and drag the same relationship again. And now NiFi sends uh, a copy of the data to the other processor as well. So you don't interfere with the existing, let's say, production flow. Now you want to start building a new one. Um, this is really valuable because uh, there's really nothing quite like production data to tell you whether or not you're on the right track. Uh, and we don't want to have to actually copy bits under the covers. And so this allows us to very efficiently do, um, you know, high-scale processing. Uh, and that's something that we can talk about more as we go forward. All right, so I'm going to take a moment just to talk through the data provenance piece. Um, this is one that, you know, you really just want to <laughs> download NiFi and try this yourself so you can see and kind of get a very uh, real sense of what this means because it's a very big deal. So while this data flow is happening, we're pulling in tweets, we're sending data to HDFS, NiFi is automatically recording the data that's being captured, information about the data being captured, where it came from, what time it occurred, pointers to the exact content at each point in the flow. And so if you just go up to the top right part um, of this graph, you can click on this data provenance icon, and that brings up a tabular, um, kind of a, a, almost like a database table looking dump of provenance events. You can then start searching for events of interest. Um, once you've done that, you can click on any one of them and have it tell you, uh, not just look at kind of a traditional log structure of what occurred, but now actually click on uh, a data lineage icon, which will then have the application uh, compute and visualize the actual graph uh, or path that the data took through the system. And so now you can see exactly where it was received and where it was sent. And if we made any uh, transformations, like if we, you know, converted the JSON to Avro or if we um, uh, extracted elements out of that JSON and created some other format, or if we did encryption or compression or decompression, whatever the case may be, there'd be a provenance event for each of those changes. And now you can right-click um, on each of those events and look exactly at what we knew at that time. Uh, you can follow the, the kind of chronolo uh, chronology of events that occur and see precisely how the data flow unfolded. <clears throat> so here's an example of looking at the details of one of those uh, you know, dots on the graph, if you will. Now keep in mind, we're looking at historical information, but this is historical information that could have literally just occurred. You could use this to essentially watch a data flow unfold, if you will. And so now here we're looking at uh, the details of a specific provenance event. You can actually click on the content tab. And what this allows you to do is view the content as it existed precisely as, at that point in the flow. Think of this like a finite state machine with persistence behind it so that you could uh, roll back time and kind of step through precisely what happened. Uh, really cool really helpful if you're doing things like transforming data from one format to another, which is a notoriously unpleasant experience uh, simply because people can't see what's happening. This has uh, addressed that problem because now you can view before and after. Um, makes it really easy to understand whether you're on the right track. It also means if you're not, let's say you did this transformation and it wasn't quite correct, it means you can fix it uh, and then click on this replay button. It will take the exact same source content and context but run it against the new configuration, now you can look at that result. And so just think about what that means for like uh, iterating, uh, essentially in real time until you get it right, and then you're good to go. Uh, so here we're actually looking at the content. Um, I'm sure that that's quite difficult to see, frankly. Uh, what's on the left in this case is an actual uh, tweet. So we're looking at the payload of the tweet. This is a, a JSON uh, object that came from Twitter, for example. Um, but we can click uh, precisely to that content. Here you can see what it looks like as a flow starts to look more realistic, right? Like I said before, it's not just linear chains. These things uh, expand out. Okay. So we talked through some of this. There's also auditing information for all the actions users are taking to uh, manipulate the flow, uh, recording what they're uh, stopping or starting or making configuration changes to. This is really critical if you're dealing with a you know, maybe a large data center configuration and you have multiple people or a large team or even multiple teams operating on the same system. You want to be able to see what people are doing and when they're making changes. 
Okay, so that was a, just sort of a quick intro uh, to what the user experience of NiFi uh, looks like, talking a little bit about the architecture. Uh, and now Tim is going to uh, help us talk about how HDF and HDP play together. Yeah, so one of the things we've been focused on for HDP, uh, powered by Hadoop, are the enterprise readiness capabilities, operations, governance, and security. And one of the things that we uh, loved about uh, Apache NiFi and sort of bringing it into a, a new product um, is that it already had some of those capabilities built in. And so what we're looking at is um, we're going to talk through uh, those enterprise readiness qualities, uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about where we want to go from here in terms of extending its operational characteristics, extending uh, provenance into the broader concept of data governance, and then uh, discussing a little bit about uh, where we'll head with, from a security perspective. So I want to start with Joe uh, talking about existing operational uh, capabilities and characteristics of, of NIFI itself. Yeah, so today NIFI supports um, essentially both a push and pull model for a lot of the really critical information. So today we can push, for example, provenance data and statistics out through our reporting tasks API. This would be uh, somebody writing code that then runs in NiFi to look at this information and then push it out to an external service, uh, Atlas, for example. Uh, there's also the pull model, which is everything that we have is exposed to this RESTful API. So an external service could uh, essentially pull NiFi to grab those statistics uh, and be uh, on their way. This is nice for people that are running uh, maybe scripts or they have some other system that is, uh, you know, it doesn't have an agent available to it, um, but it still allows it to get data, check on status, that sort of thing. Uh, as we've talked about, NiFi already supports dynamic data flow changes, which is obviously really important, uh, and we've described how that REST API allows us to do that both for people and systems. Um, Site-to-site -site is a very important uh, protocol and concept that allows uh, two NiFi clusters or two NiFi nodes or a uh, client interacting with NiFi using the site-to-site -site protocol um, to interact with NiFi using a fault-tolerant uh, and uh, scalable protocol. Um, but it also means that for a data flow manager connecting from one data center to another data center, for example, they don't have to like switch their mindset from what business thread they're operating on, enrichment they have just done, and now all of a sudden have to think about JMS or FTP or SFTP or some low-level protocol. Their mental model is connecting one processing thread at a data center to another processing thread at a data center. It keeps them at the right level of abstraction. Uh, we've already talked about the fact that it's extensible, uh, and we've put a lot of effort and energy into optimizing the user experience making it really easy for operators to understand precisely what's happening in the flow. We don't want people to have to go hunting through log files to figure out what happened. We want to expose that in a natural way. Data flows are graphs, and we can show those graphs and allow you to interact with them. So the question is, where might we go from here? So obviously, HDP is powered by Apache Hadoop, but of course, there are more than 20 different components that exist uh, within HDP today. HDF, the Hortonworks Dataflow product, is going to start with Apache NiFi, powered by NiFi. But one of the first questions that we're getting asked and uh, asked over the, uh, the chat as well is, can I explore the capabilities of pa Apache NiFi today in the context of the HTTP sandbox? And the answer is yes, you can. Um, so for those that, that want to explore that, if you go to the Hortonworks gallery, um, and you can either Google it or it's hortonworks-gallery on github.io, um, you'll see, if you click on the Ambari extensions uh, link, you'll see the ability for you to uh, deploy an instance of Apache NiFi with the HTTP sandbox. And um, you can click on the step-by-step -step instructions uh, to set that up. Now, what we're going to show you now is uh, what that actually looks like. Um, uh, from an Ambari perspective, uh, you'll go in and you'll uh, go into the Actions tab. Uh, here in the lower uh, left-hand corner. You'll add a service, and in that service uh, service wizard, um, there's an ability for you to ch uh, check the NiFi box. Um, and then you'll go through the other configuration and optional configuration parameters in that service wizard, and you go ahead and uh, deploy and light up NiFi. Now, this was put together very rapidly uh, by our brilliant partner solutions engineering team as an extension, uh, extensibility point of Ambari, uh, using the Ambari stacks. Um, and uh, again, it's a great example of 
uh, how to uh, bring these pieces together extremely rapidly. Now, for typical uh, NiPy deployment, perhaps on a jagged edge, it's a very simple deployment model where you basically untar uh, the, uh, the distribution itself. And we're going to be focused on making sure that we can continue to support the ease of deployment in both the jagged edge and the data center environments. But this sort of paints the path for how we'll take HDP, HDP and HDF forward in terms of a consistent operational experience. If we decide to add additional componentry to HDF down the road, we'll build a stack definition uh, that will allow Ambari to effectively manage and deploy all of those components uh, for those of you that are already familiar with it today. So now we're going to shift our focus, uh, Joe, back to governance and the need for, uh, for provenance. Yeah, so um, we showed you a little bit mechanically or a little bit about kind of mechanically how provenance works in NiFi, but let's back up a second and think about why is this important from a bigger picture perspective. Uh, for operators, it means that they get uh, really fine-grained traceability and lineage to, to walk through and understand what happened to data flow. And that's essentially what we showed by looking at the UI in NiFi. Uh, we also showed and talked a bit about what that means for recovery and replay. These are things that are just really, uh, frankly, very helpful. Uh, the thing that people tend to most uh, often gravitate to, though, is what it means for compliance. It forms this really rich audit trail of not just what people are doing, but what's happening to the data, uh, to data as it's flowing between systems or within systems. Uh, and that information becomes really valuable so that you can keep track of, did you deliver the right data? Um, or in the event that you may have uh, delivered the wrong data or not, uh, you know, sanitized it enough, uh, that you can understand what systems you delivered to and precisely what data you delivered them. Uh, it means you can start to uh, actually remediate uh, in the event of, uh, you know, a compliance incident or really more completely understand that compliance issue. Um, and on the flip side, it also means you can prove you were doing the right thing, which is equally important. The part that's most exciting, though, if you kind of project forward and see how this unfolds across an enterprise. Um, you already see uh, really strong uh, provenance features within HDP, which Tim, uh, I think, will we'll talk about a bit. But what this means is we can take that same story and push that out further to the edge. We can provide that provenance for the data. And now, if you have an analytic result, you can start to understand what sources were used to produce it. That means you can start to value your data sources, particularly important if you're having to pay for them. Uh, it also means you can start to value the IT systems involved in that processing chain. How long did they take processing data of critical business insights that you generate? Which systems were involved and perhaps more importantly, which systems were not involved? This chain of custody really starts to expose and show, uh, you know, where the value lives uh, across the enterprise. And so related to that, people are asking questions on the chat about data governance and what this means. So, um, we started the data governance initiative back in January of uh, 2015, and out of that came uh, Apache Atlas. Um, and again, Apache Atlas was focused on the Hadoop uh, ecosystem of products and making sure that we could do set-based governance uh, and metadata capture from the source systems all the way through to Hadoop. And what you see here now is that we will be adding the ability for you to do the event-based lineage from the internet of anything using HDF and the provenance capabilities of coming through Apache NiFi and figuring out how we connect that with the set-based capabilities that Apache Atlas is delivering. Um, other questions on the chat are asking about what, what the difference is between provenance and governance. And so the way I like to describe that is governance is the broad term that is focused on the transparent, reproducible, auditable, and consistent um, access and visibility to the data. Who touched it? When did they touch it? Why did they touch it? What happened to it? And provenance is really focused on uh, one aspect of it. And so uh, we think these two things fit very nicely together and we'll be uh, investigating more deeply uh, how to connect them in, a, in, a, in an effective fashion going forward. One of the things we do know is that there's a limited uh, persistence capability of the, um, typically of the nodes where, where NIFI may be running. And so the idea, again, is for historical uh, insights into both the data and the, uh, the metadata um, that's captured by the data provenance capabilities, we may want to flow the, um, all of the information from the provenance repositories into an operational data store that lives inside of HDP and then use that to do uh, interesting uh, reporting and analytics going forward. Uh, but the odds of jamming every uh, event, uh, piece of event lineage into Atlas is uh, unlikely at this point. 
but we'll go deeper in terms of uh, putting these pieces together and uh, providing a compelling uh, integration of those parts as we go forward. So next we're going to look at uh, a little bit about um, security. So a key point we want to get across here today uh, is um, the security story is about a lot more than just encrypting communications, right? You want to be able to make really fine-grained and real-time decisions about whether a person or a system is authorized to have or see a piece of data. Uh, and that means that you need to have, uh, you need to keep and use uh, tags on that data as well as information from within the data itself and marry that up against authoritative sources at real time or at runtime so that you can make immediate decisions about whether that data can be delivered there. When you think about a real enterprise, these are things which are changing all the time, particularly in large data centers where you have a multitude of systems or new systems come online. It's really important that you can honor kind of the current entitlements and accesses of those systems. And so that's something that NIFI does at the outset. Uh, and that's part of the reason why we've taken pluggable authorization so seriously. And then from uh, one of the things we've been doing from Hortonworks perspective is talking through the, the key qualities of, uh, of data security, administration, authentication, authorization, audit, and data protection. And of course, uh, NIFI uh, comes out of the box with a bunch of capabilities across all those dimensions. Um, so we like the consistency here in terms of describing the story and we'll also look at uh, means for extending uh, these capabilities as we go forward. And of course, um, one of the things to keep in mind, and, and this is some of the questions that we see appearing over the chat, um, and we're gonna, we're gonna dive into uh, you know, what's the relationship of uh, HDF uh, related to Storm and Kafka and Spark streaming in a, in a minute. Uh, but the idea here is that HDF will be focused on the data in motion and extracting those perishable insights while the data is in motion and HDP, the data platform itself, backed by um, Apache Hadoop, uh, will be used as the long-term persistent storage and for those historical insights. So imagine, if you will, you've got multiple uh, NIFI nodes that are running out there, each of them uh, collecting information from various uh, sensor data across the internet of anything. Um, your independent analysis of individual events can be done uh, to some degree on an individual uh, NIFI node, but if you wanted to look at a more complex uh, chain of events um, across uh, those different sensors uh, that are being delivered by each of the NIFI nodes, you are going to likely do that in a, a stream processing solution like Spark Streaming or Storm itself. Um, so that's really one of the sort of fundamental, you know, big differences is looking at individual events and, and event aggregation versus looking across collections. Um, that's one of the simplest examples that we can give. And so uh, Joe's going to talk a bit about um, what's going on within the community for, uh, for NIFI and uh, enhancements that are coming along. I'll be super brief so that we have at least 30 seconds to address <laughs> quite a few questions. Um, one of the things that people have uh, been really consistent in describing is that they're looking for better configuration management of data flows. There's a multitude of teams across an enterprise managing uh, dozens or many more um, NIFI clusters. Uh, particularly if you look at, at large enterprises, that number even gets quite larger. And those teams want to be able to share information better. They want to be able to share extensions and templates and so on. And so we're going to be tackling a lot into that. Um, if you look at the link on the bottom of this page, you can go to the Apache NIFI Communities Wiki, uh, where they talk uh, about NIFI feature proposals. Uh, and a lot of these are, all of these are described there uh, now, and you can get a better sense of where we're at, what kind of JIRAs they tie to. Uh, and some of the mailing list discussions that the community is having about where to go with these things. Um, related to that then is providing a, a extension and template registry so that you can have a single place in the enterprise where you store these things and now you can connect to your NIFI instance and say, hey, I want these extensions, I don't need those, um, but I would like to pull in this template. And, oh, hey, look, I built this new geo enrichment flow. I want to share that so that other people can do geo enrichment similarly. Um, Avro, something that we see uh, used a lot. A lot of people in the community have been very actively uh, asking for this, and so we're building a lot better uh, integration to make it easier to work with. Um, we talk a lot about interactive command and control, but we want to take that even further. We want you to be able to literally watch data flow through the system step by step. And today, you have to do it through the provenance mechanism, which is great, but even waiting, you know, that many seconds is sometimes not enough. Like, people want to be able to watch data move from queue to queue uh, and so we want to provide interactive queue management so you can see exactly what's sitting in a queue 
uh, how the priority is working, uh, and be able to immediately click to content and attributes right in line. Uh, we have a really strong authorization model today, but what we don't have is a, a deep story for multi-tenant authorization. And what we mean by that is the same flow operated on by multiple organizations simultaneously, but that their permissions are separated. And so we're going to go, uh, we're going to tackle that as well. We have a few other things that we don't have time to get into now, but um, you can look at those feature proposals to get a better view. So we're going to wrap up the uh, most popular question on the chat. Joe, tell me about the relationship between uh, HDS, Apache NIFA, and Kafka. Yeah, so um, think of Kafka as uh, a pure messaging broker, right? Uh, that is, you have producers providing data to topics, and then you have an arbitrary number of consumers that can pull from them. It's a very important part of the data flow story, um, but it is uh, essentially tuned for the space where you have uh, a domain of agreeing systems who all understand a similar schema um, uh, and format and are willing to use a specific protocol. Uh, with NIFI, we're looking at the broader enterprise data flow management story. Uh, and so these are two systems that you'll see working side by side collaboratively for uh, quite a long time. And we actually see Kafka as being an important part of HDF itself uh, as we go forward. Okay, with that, we want to thank everybody for attending today's webcast. Uh, appreciate all the questions. We try to answer as many of those uh, in real time during the chat as possible. Um, and appreciate the ratings and feedback that you've already given. Um, look for uh, announcements forthcoming uh, related to the general availability of HDF and related support subscription uh, from Hortonworks. Thanks again. Have a great day.